everything I w will say is in some kind of references, so you can get that without being physically here, but at least the exchange, I think you can only get here. So if people have questions after the lecture also, I'll be happy to try to answer. Um, so interrupt me whenever you, whenever you want. So I don't know the background, so I know that Augusto concentrated more on light cone, computing the spectrum. So the idea of at least this lecture is to, so light cone is essentially chapter one of Polchinski, and um, to get to where I want to get to for the superstring, maybe I'll have to go to chapter six. So the, the idea is to review that first for the bosonic string. But before I start, so the speed I will go at depends on the background of you. And if you ask questions, it's easy for me to figure out your background. But just to start with, how many people have already read chapters one to six of Polchinski? Can you raise your hand? Okay, so red means also done exercises. <laughs> okay, so I'll in any case, I will, I will re review it just because I will try to keep the same kind of notation when I do the superstring. But, um, but as I said, so if you ask me questions, I'll get a better idea of how fresh this is and how much you want to review. Okay, so the idea is that, um, just to give you an idea, I have six lectures, is that right? So today the idea is to discuss BRST and vertex operators. So these, uh, first for bosonic string. And then if I get to, I'll also discuss scattering amplitudes today. If not, I'll do that tomorrow. Um, and then the idea is to repeat this for RNS. And then to start to do it for the other formalism. So um, I don't know, I came in late for, um, for Gordon's talk, but RNS has some nice features, as you'll see, but it also has some um, unfortunate features. So when you want to describe Ramon Drone backgrounds, which is needed for ADS backgrounds, RNS essentially doesn't know how to do it. It knows how to do it if you want to just scatter Ramon Drone states, but it, that it knows how to do. But if you want to discuss backgrounds with finite background values for so the Ramon Ramon field, RNS doesn't know how to handle it. Um, so we'll go to the other formulas. So there's something uh, described by Green and Schwartz, which is not in Polchinski. So uh, well, at least I, if it's in Polchinski, it's in there in a hidden form. It's of course in a book by Green, Schwartz, and Witten. Um, and you need either this formalism or this formalism, which is called pure spinner formalism, um, to describe these Ramon Ramon backgrounds, and in these formalism, space time supersymmetry is manifest. So I assume Augusto did things in light cone gauge. You can either do light cone gauge RNS or light cone gauge Green Schwartz. Did he do light cone gauge Green Schwartz? Or did you? No, okay. So, so we'll see that first, light cone Green Schwartz, and then we'll do the covariant version of this. But essentially, it's the same idea. We'll see that RNS, of course, all of these things work fine until you start to describe Ramon backgrounds. So this is for another Schwartz background. And this can be found, so this is Polchinski, chapter one to six. RNS, so of volume one. So volume two, he discusses the superstring, but I think it's easier to learn this from Friedan Martinek at Schenker. So they have a nuclear physics paper. I don't remember the, something like maybe 85 or something like this, 84. Um, where this is all done at least for tree amplitudes, for loop amplitudes, some things are done. Green Schwartz, as I mentioned, you need Green Schwartz Witten. So I think it's chapter five where they discuss light cone. So this structure is not well understood in uh, Green Schwartz except in light cone gauge. So we can discuss covariant at the classical level or as Gordon discussed at the semi-classical level. But if you try to understand the full quantum green shorts, even in the flat background, there are problems. So of course, also in ADS five times S five, but uh, even in the flat background, there are problems. So we'll go then to this pure spinner formalism where we can discuss it classically and also quantum. So essentially we can reproduce these things for the pure spinner formalism. And then depending on how much time I'll have, we can discuss loop amplitudes using this pure spinner formalism. And then 
Finally, we'll discuss curve backgrounds, including ADS. So just the ADS5 times S5, and this can be done green Schwartz at the semi-classical level. You can discuss at the full quantum level in pure spinners. Okay, so these are discussed in, in lecture notes, for example. There's some lecture notes I gave at ICTP in maybe it's 2004 or 2005. Um, and then there's some more recent lecture notes um, so there's actually some lectures I gave GGI. I'll get the the HEP number later. Um, and something, uh, last week there was just a lecture note for a different school I did with uh, the next student, Umberto Gomez. So um, in any case, you have time in the afternoon, so uh, you can start to look at these references in the afternoon or ask me questions about anything you don't understand. Okay, so this is the plan. If there's something here that, uh, there's something that you don't see on the plan and you want me to discuss, just tell me either um, whenever you want. Okay. okay, so any questions yet? Okay, so the motivation, there are various motivations, of course. One is to understand the ADS5 times S5, but uh, also to understand why superstring theory solves the problem of quantum gravity in the sense that it, it doesn't have the divergences that are present in certainly ordinary gravity theories and uh, even in supergravity theories. So there are some conjectures that supergravity, if you have enough supersymmetry, might be finite, but I think, to be honest, there's no arguments for it. So uh, I, uh, of course, up to a certain loop level, supersymmetry allows you to, um, to show that it's finite, but uh, beyond those loop levels, there are people computing, but I don't think there's any arguments why they should expect that at arbitrary loop level, supergravity is finite, but in superstring theory, you can actually prove that it's finite. So, so that's uh, understanding why that works and how it works, um, I think, is one motivation. And of course, the other motivation is to understand these applications such as ADS5 times S5 or other ADS-CFT correspondences. Um, and as was mentioned, I mean, even the fundamentals of superstring theory is not yet well understood. We don't have any clues yet how to describe M theory in the same way as we describe super uh, string theory. And hopefully, if you get a better understanding of superstring theory, as you'll see, the formulations that have been described up to now, they all have some advantages, some disadvantages, and getting a better understanding of superstring theory, I think, will probably lead to a better understanding of this formal duality structure and things like that, which at the moment are just, in some, say, some sense, conjectures, in some sense, there's more evidence, less evidence. But uh, I think if you're going to get a proof or a better understanding, it's really going to come from a better understanding first of the superstring. Okay, so now, so that's more or less the motivation, um, but of course, during the lectures, you'll hear more things. Um, any questions? So again, the idea is for you to ask questions. Okay, so we'll start with BRST. So I guess I'll assume that people have seen BRST before, but um, I won't assume that they've seen it for the string. Um, so we'll start by just reviewing how it works for the particle, just because it's not usually done in first quantized language. So usually when you learn BRST, you learn it through quantum field theory lectures. And really, the first time it appeared in first quantized language is really through string theory. I think uh, Siegel was the first one to understand the role and then um, it played a role in string field theory and then people really understood that um, BRST is us useful from the start when you discuss first quantized theories. So, um, so I'll work at least in the first part of the lecture here in Hamiltonian formalism just because it makes life as you'll see, slightly simpler. So suppose you want to describe just a massless particle. Or we can do massive particle. So of course, one way to describe it is using, if we have a massive particle, plus we can describe it in this way. But of course, this doesn't make sense in the massless limit. So if you want to describe it in the massless limit also, it's convenient to use 
what's called the first order formalism or Hamiltonian formalism. We have P and X. And then the idea is you put in a Lagrange multiplier times the mass shell constraint. So of course this is no problem with taking the massless limit, you just take M equals zero. And then P of course appears quadratically, so you can integrate it out. And you can write the action if you want in various forms like one over E. But I'm not going to do it that way. I'm just going to leave it like this and just quantize it directly. So uh, let me ask, so this is a brave question. How many people have never seen this before? Okay, so everybody has seen it. Okay, I could have asked the inverse question, but I'm sorry? Okay, but did he quantize this? Okay. Okay, so now to quantize it, what we want to do is we can gauge fix. So this, this has a, a gauge invariance because this is a first class constraint. So the gauge invariance you get just by, um, if the gauge parameter, let's call it omega, or let's, okay, let's call it epsilon just so. So if you commute, so I'm setting h bar and i equal 1, okay? So if you commute the constraint with x, then you get this type of gauge transformation of x, right? This is just p. Okay, just to put the i's and h bars back in, you'll get something like this, right? So this is the, this is the gauge transformation generated by this constraint. Is that clear? Any questions? Okay, so if you do this for epsilon constant, then of course uh, this is going to give you just p dot, so that's a total derivative. But if epsilon depends on tau, then it's no longer um, invariant under this. You'll get a total derivative, which can be canceled by a trans transformation of E. And probably I need a factor of minus, and maybe there's a half here. So I'm not being careful with factors of two and minus one. And if I if I write up notes, I'll I'll be more careful with these things. Okay. So is this clear? So this term is going to change. This is going to change by something like delta epsilon. I can write this as equal, up to a total derivative, I can write this as delta of uh, plus total derivative. Okay, is that clear? I'll do it more carefully. This is epsilon dot p squared plus epsilon p dot p. All right, so this is equal to dot one half plus okay okay so this is the general form when you have uh, the action in first order form you have the term px dot yeah So the general form is when you have px dot and then you have a Lagrange multiplier times the first class constraint. The gauge transformation is that the fields transform by commuting them with the constraint. And then Lagrange multiplier transforms with the derivative or the negative derivative of the parameter. Okay. If you've never seen this before, um, it's easy to work out. Okay. So this this is true for any first class constraint. Okay. Okay. So now we want to gauge fix. So the simple way to gauge fix is to use this transformation of E to gauge e equal one. 
Of course, you could have gauged D equals zero, but it's convenient to gauge E equals one. Okay. So, of course, using the usual Fadeh proper procedure, because E changes by a total derivative, that introduces a ghost, this gauge fixing. Right? So this implies a day pop of ghosts. And the action for the Fadeya pop of ghosts is just, as usual, the um, operator acting on the ghost does the same thing as the uh, transformation of the of the parameter you used to gauge fix, of the transformation of the of the field you used to gauge fix. Okay. So this is a usual Fadev pop of ghost procedure, where this um, the determinant coming from these ghosts just cancels the the term you get from the gauge fixing. So after gauge fixing. In this gauge, E equals 1, so you just get 1 half P squared. So if your gauge E equals 0, it would be a little bit strange. So that's, a, that's a, uh, uh, not a very nice gauge. But of course, I could have fixed E equals 2. It wouldn't change anything. Okay. And then you get the contribution from the ghosts. OK, so now if you want, of course, you can integrate out get something like minus one half x dot squared. You integrate out p or use the equation of motion for p in terms of x dot. So this is the new action, which is gauge fixed. But you have to remember the constraint. So when you have first class constraints and you gauge fix, you still have to remember th the presence of the constraint. And that comes through the BRST procedure by constructing a BRST operator, which is the ghost times the constraint. So this system, when you quantize, is described by a gauge fixed action. Gauge fixed means that um, I've already gauge fixed. It no longer has this local symmetry, together with a BRST operator. Okay. So physical states are described by states which are annihilated, or more precisely, in the cohomology of this BRST operator. Now, I could, have, I could have, of course, done it with mass. Then you'd have minus m squared here, and then there would be a minus m squared here. But just because we're going to soon go to the string, we might as well set m squared equals here. So this describes a massless particle. And then to see why it describes a massless particle, Let's consider a state here, which is now going to be built out of these fields. So it's built out of the x's and the b's and c's. Of course, I could have either choose, so because the b and c's satisfy canonical anti-commutation relations, and the x's and p's also satisfy the usual commutation relations, it's either a function of x, and x or p and b or c. Okay. So let's choose it to be a function of the x's and the c's, OK? So the others will be the momentum, and these will be the coordinates. So c is anti-commuting. So in general, this has two possible terms. Either it doesn't have the c or it does. So let's call this, I guess, phi of x. And I'll write this as c phi star of x. So this is a general state. And now we want to decide when this state is in the cohomology of Q. And those will decide, describe the physical states. OK. So now we have to solve the condition. QV equals 0. And V does not equal Q of something. So that's the definition of cohomology. If I have a BRST operator. The BRST operator is obviously nilpotent. That follows from the fact that 
this is a first class constraint. Of course, there's only one constraint. So if you just have one constraint, it's obviously first class. It commutes with itself. So because C is anti-commuting, Q squared equals zero. So um, if V is Q of something, then it automatically satisfies Q of it equals zero. So these are the physical states. And now we can see what it implies. So let's look at phi first. So this implies that C, P squared, using the usual commutation relations for P, so um, P with X is just IH bar. This tells you that C box phi equals zero. And then because C squared equals zero, this doesn't give you any constraints on this phi star. Yes? I could have written it in terms of B. We'll do that next. Just So it's just a choice of coordinates versus momentum. You could have asked, how do I know it depends on X and not on P, right? Yes. So the commutation relations coming from this action is P with X and B with C. These are anti-commutators. I don't remember if it's I or... But so the state is, okay? No. It's just another field. Any other question? I just wrote down what it is in general. It's a function of x and c. So because c is anti-commuting, there's only two terms. But it's an arbitrary function of x. Phi is an arbitrary function of x. Phi star is an arbitrary function of x. Okay. Any other question? Okay, so QV equals zero only implies an equation for phi. And omega, of course, I could also expand. Omega is equal to, let's call it small omega plus, so omega is also just some arbitrary function of this. Now, of course, Q omega, capital omega, this gives me C box omega, right? So that can't affect phi, but it can affect phi star. So instead of writing it this way, let's write it this way. Delta V is equal Q omega. This implies that delta phi star is equal C box omega. So this is an arbitrary capital omega. If I take Q of it, the only thing you're going to get is C box small omega. So we see that phi doesn't change under delta V, but phi star does. Okay, okay so what are the equations we get? Well, we get that phi has to satisfy box equals zero. C box omega, isn't that what I wrote? Oh, oh, sorry, thank you. Yeah, 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 right, right. Thanks. And we get that phi star is not equal to Okay? So this is the usual thing you would expect. This implies that this satisfies the massless Klein-Gordon equation. So this describes a massless scalar. But it turns out this also describes something with the same degrees of freedom is phi. Why? Because if box is zero, then you cannot gauge phi star away. But if box is anything different from zero, then you can gauge phi star away. So in fact, the cohomology of this is also box phi star equals zero. Right? Yeah. So let's suppose we can diagonalize the operator box. So it either has zero eigenvalues or non-zero eigenvalues. If it has a zero eigenvalue, then phi star, obviously this is zero, so you cannot eliminate phi star. But if it has a non-zero eigenvalue, then you can eliminate phi star. So it means that phi star, the cohomology implies that phi star has zero eigenvalue. So in fact, box phi star is also. So what we find is that this also seems to describe 
a massless scalar. And in fact, you always have this duality. So you always get double the cohomology. And in fact, this object here has a different ghost number from this object here. If I define C to have ghost number one, then this has ghost number zero and this has ghost number one. Okay. So this duality between fields of different ghosts we will see again in the string. So this is what's called a field. And this is what's called an anti-field. And that's why I use this star notation, just because usually um, when people just write down the anti-field, they put a star on it. Okay. So if you want to learn more about this type of quantization, which was developed by Batalin and Vilkovitsky, you will learn more about these things. But uh, this is all I wanted to say up to now about uh, the particle. Okay, so just to repeat. So we start with this action which has a local symmetry. The local symmetry turns out to be equivalent to reparameterization invariance. So if you had written this action in the way that most people would write it, which would be M then it's easy to see that this action has reparameterization invariance. If you write this action in first order form, which means you just define P to be equal to the derivative of the Lagrange with respect to X dot, then you'll, you'll find this type of action, okay, where this is the constraint. So probably I should, I don't know if Augusto showed that. So he probably did, but uh, just to review it. So one way to see how to, so it's easy to see how to go from here to here. What you do is you, you integrate out P, you use the equation of motion for P, and then you use the equation of motion for E. And if I put in the M squared, it's easy to go from here to here. Okay? Going the other way is also easy. So what you do is you, you define P to be the canonical momentum. So that's, the derivative of the Lagrange with respect to x dot. So if you do that here, you'll find it is equal to x dot m over squared to x dot squared times m and, um, yeah, I think that's right. And now you notice that this pm satisfies this constraint. It's not an independent, not all the components of p are independent. They satisfy a constraint. And then you impose that constraint using the Lagrange multiplier. So that's the way to go from here to here. Okay. okay, so this is obviously possible in any of these formulations of, of first quantized actions. You can go either from the first order form or to the second order form by using this identification of the constraints. Okay, any questions? Okay. So the reason why I'm doing this first for the massless particle is because now I want to do it for the string and I don't want to, it's something you've already seen, but you've seen it in a different language. So that's why I want to do it for the particle to make sure you understand um, what the different steps are. So before I go to the string, are there any questions? Okay. Okay, so you're used to seeing the string written in terms of the Polyakov formalism, probably. Is that how, that's how it goes, yes, please. Yeah. Why did I not put? Okay, so it's always the ghost. So, um, when you do the BRST quantization and you produce these ghosts, you have ghosts and sometimes these are called anti-ghosts. So C and B are not, they're not symmetric. C carries ghost number plus one and B carries ghost number minus one. And the action is obtained, although this action, of course, you could also write it as minus 
um, B dot C, this is an accident. Normally B and C don't necessarily appear symmetrically. So the, the BRST operator is always the ghost times the constraint. Not, I don't know if that answers your question. Or you want to know why? Or so let's look at the transformation. So what's the BRST procedure? The BRST procedure is you have the gauge parameter and you replace it by the ghost. So uh, have you seen BRST before? So in field theory, so you've probably seen it in field theory. So you have delta A mu is equal to D mu of lambda. So this would be the usual gauge parameter, the gauge transformation of A mu. So to get the BRST procedure, you just replace the lambda by C. So this is the gauge transformation. Now if we do that here, if we replace the epsilon by C, then you can see that this is precisely the transformation Q of X mu. So this is Q acting on, uh, so this is C p squared, the commutator of cp squared with x mu, which is just equal to, well, up to factor of 2. This is equal to cp mu. Okay. So it's you always replace the parameter, the gauge parameter with the ghost, and that's why the, the BRST operator is just c times the constraint. So it carries ghost number 1. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? 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 Yep. Um, so the question of what you're calling ghost number zero in some sense is arbitrary. So I could have called this ghost number one and then this would be ghost number two. But okay, um, why ghost number zero is the physical states? I, I don't have a good answer. There might be a good answer, but I don't know it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so now we want to do the string. So of course we could have written the action in Polyakov form or even Nambugoto form. So in Nambugoto form it's something like and if you do canonical quantization you can work out what the momentum are. So why don't I give that, you have time in the afternoon. Right? So one homework exercise. Work out the momentum PM for the string. And show So I'll tell you what the constraints are here. You're going to get two kinds of constraints. I'll call this E, and I'll call this E bar. So we're going to get two kinds of constraints. So show that this satisfies these two constraints. So these are the Fierozor constraints. Is it clear the exercise? So start with Nambu Goto action. I assume you've seen that. Define the canonical momenta and then show that it satisfies this constraint so that P plus x prime squared is zero and p minus x prime squared equals zero. Okay. <laughs> this is just dx d tau. And uh, sorry, this is d tau d sigma now. So x of course is a function of tau and sigma. So p will also be a function of tau and sigma. But here this is always just px dot. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so um, 
once you get to this form, we know how to quantize. We have E and E bar. And actually, I'll give you two ways to quantize. Let me give you uh, first the covariant way to quantize. And then just to connect with what you saw last week, I will show how to go to light cone gauge from this. Okay. So the covariant way to quantize is to covariant means it preserves conformal invariance. So light cone gauge is, of course, not Lorentz covariant, but it's also doesn't preserve conformal invariance, world shape conformal invariance. So it's not covariant both in in both senses. Okay, and this quantization will preserve both conformal invariance on the world sheet and um, Lorentz covariance in space-time. So we'll choose the gauge E equals E bar equals 1. Now, how, what allows us to choose that gauge? Well, again, we have symmetries. So what are the symmetries? So the constraints are P plus X prime squared and P minus X prime squared equals 0. So, for example, we can figure out how x transforms by now using the canonical computation relations of p and x. So, pm of sigma with xn of sigma prime is now going to be equal to a to mn delta of sigma minus sigma prime. So, they commute unless they're at the same value of sigma. And that's going to tell you that the transformation of x, so if I put an epsilon here, the transformation is going to be something like this. Epsilon P right, because one of them will just produce the delta function and you s you'll be left with one left over. So I guess if I want, I should put a half here also. So this is, uh, let's call it delta 1. So this is the one generated by epsilon, and I'll call this one delta 2, the one generated by epsilon bar. So this transforms like P minus X. So these are the the transformations of x under these two constraints. Okay, so this is the gauge transformation. If I now allow epsilon to depend on tau and sigma, this is a gauge transformation. What you'll find is that p un in the previous case p did not transform, right? Because in the previous case the constraint was p squared equals zero, and of course because p with p is zero, that says that delta p. We only had the transformation of x. We didn't have the transformation of p. But now you see the constraint involves x. So we're also going to get a transformation of p. So the transformation is going to be delta pm. So that's going to come if I put a pm here, right? So now the, com the contribution comes because of this, but you get an extra derivative. So instead of being um, just with this, you'll get an extra derivative coming from the fact that you have a derivative on the sigma, on, on the x. So you get something like this. So it just comes from the fact that although p with x satisfies this, Obvious if I take d d sigma prime of both sides, I'll get d d sigma prime of the delta function. Okay, so that's going to give me a d d sigma here. Okay. I'm sorry. Say it again. Yes. Uh, what was the question? Oh, sorry. Um, so, 
Good question. So when I'm writing this, I can do it two ways. I can either let epsilon depend on sigma, and then what I'm really writing is this. So if I choose epsilon to be a delta function in sigma, then it's going to just choose p plus x prime at a certain, at a certain sigma. But if I want to do a general, uh, I mean, a more general transformation, which might involve different sigmas, a convenient way to write it is like this. And then what you see is that um, if I take this at sigma prime, then the delta function is going to just kill this integration over sigma, and you're just left with epsilon of sigma prime, p plus x prime of sigma. Okay. Here. So the, I, I, sh I should have written it like this. Thanks. But here there's no integration. This is just at the same sigma. So you'll always find that that's true, that the, the gauge transformation is always local, although the, con the constraint, if you write it in this way, is going to be something that looks non-local. So this integral, of course, is also going to be in the BRST operator when you write it, when you replace epsilon by the ghost. Any other questions? Okay, so because X and P both transform, <coughs> life is a little bit more complicated. But using the same uh, explanation as before, what you find is that E is going to transform in such a way that it cancels the transformation of x and p. And what you'll find is when you do the computation, you'll find that the epsilon only transforms under, I'm sorry, e only transforms under epsilon, and e bar will only transform under epsilon bar. It's just because you get a cancellation of these two terms in here if you choose the right signs. Okay. So this is the transformation of x. And you see it's similar to the transformation of P. And if you put the right sign here, this is not going to transform. Okay. So what you'll find is that E transforms like um, epsilon dot. Ah, plus, sorry. There's an extra term coming from, from the sigma derivative. Okay, so this will be the transformation. Uh, and I, I left off one thing, sorry. There's an additional complication. So let me say, well, it's not really a complication, but so this is the transform. Let's consider just epsilon. This is the transformation of x. This is the trans of transformation of p. If you Compute the transformation of this term, you'll find that it be can be canceled by this transformation here. Okay. But you also get a transformation of this. So as I said, this term won't transform because you'll get cancellation between the two terms. But here they will transform. And you'll need an additional transformation of E. You, sh you can show that the transformation of this term is going to be proportional to itself. So it can be canceled by it transformation of E, which has this form here. So again, up to signs, but uh, so this term here is going to be proportional to itself, which can means that it can, of course, be canceled by a redefinition or a transformation of E proportional to E. So up to possible signs, this is the transformation that you need of E so that the transformation of this term gets canceled by transformation of E. Okay. This comes from the fact that these constraints, although they are first class, these are the Virazora constraints, they're not abelian the first class. They commute with themselves to give you the same constraint back. Okay. 
So that, of course, is gener generically going to be the case when you have first-class constraints. In the particle case, the first-class constraint was a billion. Essentially, there was only one of them, so it was obviously a billion. In this case, you have an infinite number of constraints because they depend on sigma. So when you take the commutator of two of them, it's no longer zero, but it's proportional to the constraint itself. So it's something like, again, I don't know the, there'll be a term delta sigma minus sigma prime times something like p squared dd sigma. There'll be terms of this type. They only contribute when sigma is sigma prime, but they will have delta functions and also derivatives of delta functions. Okay. And that's why you need these terms here. So this is, um, as soon as you have non-abelian first-class constraints, or first-class constraints which don't all commute, which, commu which don't trivially commute, you'll have additional terms in the transformation of the Lagrange multiplier. Okay, are there any questions? Yes? Yes, so these, on, in this action, it's clear that the gauge symmetries are transformations tau prime yes and those reparameterizations when you write it in terms of the moment Hamiltonian formalism they're generated by these first class constraints yeah so that's related to the fact that you have two functions here so more precisely, epsilon is related to tau plus sigma goes to tau prime plus sigma prime. But that's right. If you were working in two-dimensional Minkowski space, these are independent. If you're working in two-dimensional Euclidean space, then you put an I here and they become complex conjugates. Okay. Yeah. So the second term is of the form d sigma delta of sigma minus sigma prime times p squared plus x prime squared. And I don't know the coefficients, but there are two terms of that type. There's one term which doesn't involve the um, derivative of the delta function and the other term which does. So later we'll see what these look like in terms of the, the stress energy tensor. But this is essentially the generator. Of, this is essentially the Virzor algebra, if you write it in terms of sigma and sigma prime, in terms of in, instead of in terms of the modes. So probably you've seen this in, in, in terms of this type of algebra. Lm with Ln is equal to delta of m plus n times. Okay. Any other question? It should have been that. Yes. This is Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so this is um, so this is BRST quantization. So um, okay, before we figure out what the cohomology is. Um, so are there any questions? Well, uh, just I can write down the BRST operator just without doing the cohomology. So the BRST operator we get by just, it's the, const the ghost times the constraint. Now we have epsilon, epsilon bar, so we have two types of ghosts. So I'll call these ghosts, um, oh, you'll see what I call them. So you have d sigma, because there's an integral over sigma here. So the first one we'll call c. So everything is a function of sigma. I'm not going to write it, keep writing it. And then we have a term c bar times p minus x prime squared. So this is constraint times ghost. But we're not finished because we have this 
these extra terms in the transformation of the of the Lagrange multiplier. If you stopped here, you would find that q squared was not zero. Again, because this constraint does not commute with itself because of this algebra. So we need to introduce another term. So the other term you have to introduce is b times c times c prime. And here you have to introduce b, I think it's minus, I'm not sure. So unlike in the particle where the B goes never appeared in the BRST operator, here it appears. And it has to appear in order for Q squared to be equal to zero. Because if you take the anti-commutator of this with itself, because of the fact these don't commute, you get a term left over, which is canceled by the anti-commutator of this with this. Okay, the B with the C is going to, oh, let's do the computation. So Q squared, it gives you a term C times, so it's just Q squared because this is anti-commuting. So the anti-commutator itself is just twice Q squared. So you get a term like s integral s d sigma, C of sigma, times P plus X prime squared sigma. And then you get a term sigma Let's call it sigma prime, C of sigma prime. So this is Q squared just from the first two terms, just from the first term. And now, if there was no um, contribution here from the commutator of this type, then you would get the fact that these two objects here would cancel just because uh, this is anti-commuting. So if there was no singularity, if you would, if you like, there was no commutator from here and here, then you would find that, that this is just zero. Because of this uh, extra contribution, you find that this term is equal to d sigma c of sigma d c of sigma or c c prime. times a term of the type so you get a contribution precisely coming from the fact that these two don't commute okay. and this contribution here is cancelled by the contribution from the anti-commutator of this with this so you'll get another term which is g sigma c of sigma So now I'm taking this term with this, and what you'll find again, so actually there are two terms because it, this could appear first or this could appear second. So now you have an anti-commutator here. And this is going to give me the same thing with a minus sign. So you need both terms here. So this is the generic structure of a BRST operator. You get ghost times constraint, and then you have anti-ghost times two ghosts contracted with the, the structure constants coming from the algebra. So if, you're, you, if you've seen BRST in, in the more generic language, BRST has this form. It's ghost times constraint, let's call the constraint G, and then if you have more than one of them, you have to sum over j, and then you get another term, which is of the type b, k, c, j, c, l, f, k, j, l, where these f's are the structure constants from the algebra of the constraint. So g, c, g, Okay. 
So this is the generic structure of a BRST operator, and if you go to Polchinski, one of the exercises to show that this is satisfies Q squared equals zero. Okay? So you have to use the, the Lie algebra um, properties of the structure constants. Yes? I can't just add anything onto what? On? Yeah. This one? Okay, so the f when you say you know, you have to start with the assumption that these constraints here are first class. That, that means that the G's satisfy an algebra where this algebra is consistent, so it satisfies the Jacobi identity. Once you have that property, you know that the, the action here is going to be invariant if you suitably modify the transformation of the Lagrange multiplier. Okay? So once you have this, from this transformation, you can actually read off what these terms are. So it's, I'm not adding, although it looked like I added that by hand, you can actually derive it from the transformations of these Lagrange multiplier. Okay, so the consistency really is that these are first class constraints. That's the only ingredient I need to use. So I assume everybody knows what first class and second class constraints are. First class constraints are constraints that when you take the canonical commutation, you get another first class constraint. Second class constraints, which we'll see tomorrow or maybe Wednesday, are when the commutator of two first class constraints don't give another constraint. They give something which is non-zero. Okay. So first class just means that they satisfy this type of algebra. Okay, any questions? Okay, so this is the BRST operator for the string. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll take a five minute break uh, so people can ask questions, whatever. And then uh, as soon as we come back, I'll, I'll show how there's an additional, this is one choice of gauge. This is the gauge in which the BRST operator is manifestly Lorentz invariant. And in fact, maybe even before the break, there's one other thing I wanted to say, which is th I sh this is the BRST operator, but I didn't write down the action in that gauge. So the action This gauge is very simple because we just gauge E equal one. So in the gauge E equals one, you just get S equals All right, so you just get one here and one here. Let me put a half. So the, the cross terms, p dot x prime cancel, those are the two terms. So you're just left with I guess it's p squared plus x prime squared. Now you just use the equation of motion for p. So again, I'm off by factors a half, but If you do things correctly, you should get something like minus x dot squared plus x prime squared. Which you can write, of course, as where d is equal to d d tau plus d d sigma, and d bar is equal to d d tau minus. Maybe with a minus sign here. I'm sorry? Ah, sorry. I, good. I didn't, I'll put it in the ghost in a second. Okay, so, but from the x dependence, what you get is you just get dx d bar x, just the usual free quadratic action. If you go to, if you wick rotate to Euclidean, then of course there's a factor of i here, and these become just the usual complex derivatives. Okay, as was mentioned, I forgot the ghosts. So the ghosts, of course, come from the gauge transformation of the of the Vierbein, of the of the Lagrange multipliers. So you see, you get d d tau plus d d sigma here. It turns out that the, the other term you get goes away when e equals one. So this just becomes the ghost contribution. Just gives me b c dot plus c prime 
was b bar c dot minus c prime. So this just gives me Okay, so this action, of course, is just quadratic, so it's simple to work with. It has the uh, property that it's conformally invariant. If you suitably transform the B and the ghosts. Okay. And Q, of course, once you use the equation of motion for P, you can also write Q in a simple form. So Q is going to be equal to d sigma c dx squared plus b c d c plus c bar d bar x squared. So this comes from just replacing p by its equation of motion. Uh, in this in this gauge choice, p just becomes like x dot. So it just becomes x dot plus x prime, x dot. Minus. Okay, so Q has this simple form, and the action has this simple form. Okay. When we do a similar gauge fixing in light cone gauge after the break, you'll see that um, the action is still simple, but it's not conformally invariant and it's not Lorentz covariant. And that's going to, well, you've seen that last week too. Okay, any questions? Okay, so E equals zero is a singular gauge. The point is that um, E plays the role of a Vierbein. So normally you have a constraint which, um, if you fix the length of the string, then you're assuming that um, the integral of the Vierbein along the, along the length of the string is fixed. It's a, some constant. So if you choose the gauge E equals zero, there's no way to make this equal to the length of the string. So it's it's a singular gauge choice in the sense that it makes the length of the string infinite, I guess. Okay. Okay, any other questions? So in the in the first form of this the integral over integral I'm sorry, uh this is the BRST operator. So the BRST operator, remember, came from the fact that the Gauge parameter depend on sigma. Okay. Any other question? Yes. I'm sorry. It's related to the world sheet metric, but um, it's not a. I mean, in conformal gauge, the world sheet metric just drops out. So what you will find is that. Um, when you have curvature on the world sheet, E equals 1 and E bar equals 1 is not to, you can't consistently make that gauge choice. So I'm assuming that locally the metric is flat, world sheet metric is flat, and then I've essentially eliminated all the world sheet metric. But you're right. Um, if I write the action in reparameterization invariant form before doing the gauge fixing, these are related to two components of the metric. The third component, the conformal gauge, never appears in this one. Yeah, because I have, so, because I have the um, the two different ghosts, and I'm calling one of them C and one of them C bar. This action. Yeah. Uh, there is this. Sorry, this should have been a C bar. That was my fault. Sorry about it. Any other questions? Okay, so let's take a five minute break.
Okay, so uh, are there any questions before I talk about light cone gauge? Okay, so in this gauge, we chose, we choose, we use these two uh, gauge parameters, epsilon and epsilon bar, to gauge e equal to one. So this would be conformal gauge, or sometimes it's called covariant gauge. There's another thing, gauge choice you could do is instead of gauging e equal to one, you can gauge x and p. But obviously, I can't gauge all of x and p because you only have one. You have epsilon and epsilon bar. So what you can do is you can gauge x, x plus. So plus, I assume you all, all know like notation, right? So um, you choose one component, x plus, to be independent of, tau, independent of sigma. And you choose one component of p plus to be independent of sigma. So we use the sigma dependence of epsilon, or in other words, the non zero modes, so zero modes with respect to sigma, to gauge the non zero modes of x and p plus, x plus and p plus to be equal to zero. Okay. So you still have one degree of freedom, I mean, you still have the sigma independent components of epsilon and epsilon bar. And we're going to use that to gauge fix the sigma independent components of this. Okay, so we're go going to also uh, gauge not E, but the integral of E to be equal to the integral of E bar to be equal to 1. So the sigma dependent components of epsilon epsilon bar we used to gauge away the sigma dependent components of x plus and p plus. So we still have the sigma independent component, right? Which is just a zero mode. And the zero modes of epsilon and epsilon bar we're going to use to gauge away the zero modes of E and E bar, okay? Is it clear? So this is what's called call light cone gauge. Okay, so in light cone gauge, what we'll find is that because of the X and P transformations, they transform, remember that the ghosts came from the fact that you had derivatives acting on the, on the gauge parameter. Because of the way epsilon appears here, when you do this gauge fixing, there's no tau derivatives acting on epsilon, which means that the gauge, that the ghosts, if you like, they, uh, they don't propagate. Okay. So you don't get any ghosts coming from this gauge fixing of x and p. You do get a single ghost coming from the, the gauge fixing of E, but that single ghost is just a sigma independent ghost. Okay, it's like in the, the ordinary particle. So what you'll find after gauge fixing So okay, let's do it more carefully. Okay, so you're going to get uh, this constraint here. So let's look at this constraint here. So what's going to happen is that in this gauge, where you gauge x plus prime and p plus prime to be equal to zero, the p minus um, degree of freedom here is going to be just multiplied by the sigma independent components of E. So the equation of motion coming from varying E, this is going to imply that the sigma um, dependent components of P plus X prime squared equals zero.
and similarly from E bar. Now these constraints are just algebraic constraints. I mean, they, don't, they just come from varying E. And similarly, what you'll find is that the sigma dependent components of E, the equation of motion for them, if you vary with respect to P prime, it's going to imply that the, that the equations of motion for all the components of E except for the, the sigma independent component is zero. Now the uh, the rest of the components of uh, the, the sigma de independent components of p plus x prime are still in the BRST operator, but now the e goes outside. So this you can write down as e. So this is my BRST operator. These C and C bar are now independent of tau, are independent of sigma, sorry. So that's why I just pulled them out of the integral. So this is my light cone BRST operator. And you see, it only involves the sigma independent part of P plus X prime squared, just the zero mode part. All the sigma dependent part of p plus x prime squared, that's an equation of motion. So that's, uh, that in fact allows you to solve, this equation of motion allows you to solve, for example, p minus, or more, in, or more precisely the, the sigma derivative of p minus in terms of the other field. So it's going to be something like you'll get terms here. I'm not going to write down all the terms. So the equations of motion are going to fix the sigma dependent parts of E. It's going to fix the sigma dependent parts of P minus and also X minus in terms of the other field. And the resulting action only depends on the transverse parts of P and X okay? and on the zero mode of, of E. So the resulting action So you're left with P minus, but just the zero mode part. Um, I guess I'll put a, to denote the zero mode part, let me put a, a, a hat on it. So this has no sigma dependence. If you like the sigma, well, I could have just taken this out. In any case, this is just a zero mode part. The non-zero mode part, as I already mentioned, is all, is all fixed by the equations of motion. Okay. Because there are no tau derivatives involved in solving these equations of motion, so it's just auxiliary equations of motion. And then this part here, you just get, as I said, only the zero mode part of this um, contributes, and I've gauged it to be equal to one. So you just get the transverse parts of this thing. Okay, plus a similar thing with the minus. And from the longitudinal directions, you only get the zero mode part also. So you just get something like Right. So when when this is in the plus when this is in the plus direction, this of course vanishes. Right. So I think I've wrote. Oh, there's one other term I forgot to write down, which is PJ. So for these terms, of course, you have sigma dependence. There's no hat on them. 
Okay, so just to repeat. So we started with this action. We gauged all the sigma dependent components, all the sigma dependent modes of x plus and p plus to zero. And the sigma dependent parts of E we gauge to zero also. So it's just the sigma independent part of this. Okay, so the sigma independent part of the p plus and p minus contribute here. And the transverse parts of here, of course, contribute all their modes. Okay? Both the sigma dependent and sigma independent modes. But when this is in the longitudinal direction, plus or minus, the only thing that contributes is the P plus P minus, just the zero mode part of that. Okay? Because these are the sigma dependent parts. Vanish. Okay, so now you can integrate out P plus and P minus, the and also, of course, the transverse ones. And then you're just left with the usual light cone action. So we have the, from the transverse parts, integrating out P is just going to give me just like we had before in the covariant case. So you'll get the, the X dot plus X prime, uh, X dot squared plus X prime squared, they will combine to the DD bar. In the longitudinal directions, you just get contributions from the zero modes, from the sigma zero modes. So when you integrate out the zero modes of P plus and P minus, you just get this. And of course, you still get the ghosts, but just the zero mode part. So let me put a hat on it. And Q, I already wrote down here. OK, so you see we're broken conformal invariance because there's some terms that don't even have sigma dependence. So they obviously, if you do a conformal transformation, um, it's clear that these terms are not going to be conformal invariant. These terms are, but. And of course you've broken space-time Lorentz transformations because you've signaled out the plus and minus direction. The advantage is that the ghost structure is much simpler, okay? Instead of having these infinite set of sigma dependent ghosts, now you just have a single ghost for the zero mode, okay, or uh, two ghosts for the zero modes. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now the next step is to compute the cohomology. Okay. Maybe since I already have this on the board, let's compute the cohomology first for the light cone, and then we'll do the, the full covariant. So this is almost like the relativistic particle. This just has a single constraint, although it looks like uh, uh, it looks like you have an infinite set because this depends on sigma. It's only the zero mode of this which is in the BRST operator. So this Q squared equals zero. There's no, I mean, there's only one constraint here, so everything is abelian. Okay. So the the cohomology is going to look very similar to what we had in the particle case. So again, we have V is equal to, let's call it phi. And now, of course, it could depend on all the modes of sigma for the transverse directions. But in the plus and minus direction, it only depends on the zero mode, right? Because those are the only modes that enter into the action. Is it clear? And then, of course, you can also have dependence on uh, C hat and C bar hat. Okay, I assume Augusto did open string also, right? Yes? Okay, so for the open string, just to reduce the amount of computations, let's just do the open string. So for the open string, you choose boundary conditions such that C hat is equal C bar hat. Okay, so we really only have, only have one of these.
Okay, so what we're going to find, and, and of course this is going to be equal to this, because on the, on the boundary of the string, x prime is equal to zero. So we're going to have to compute qv. Uh, so this, of course, I can expand in um, two terms. That's what I meant to write down here. And now I can do the same analysis we did for the particle. So qv equals 0 implies that this object here acting on phi where okay the p plus x prime this is just the usual canonical commutation relations okay. so what this is going to imply so p plus x prime squared of course I can expand this in modes This has a term p0 squared, and then there's a term one. All right, where this plus one and minus one refers to the, the mold number in sigma. So I'm just writing the integral over sigma in, in terms of the modes. Okay. And I'm ignoring normal ordering I assume that you've seen uh, these normal ordering discussions of it. So setting this equals zero is going to imply that the mass squared, so this is just equal mass squared, is going to be related to the um, to the mode numbers of this of acting on the state. Okay. So so this phi, if I expand it in terms of the modes of these xj's. This condition here is just going to give you the usual light cone spectrum. Okay. So in light cone gauge, you get a single constraint, which tells you that the mass squared of the of the state is related to the essentially the creation operators acting on the state or the the mode number. Okay. So it's no longer um, fixed, but it depends on how the string is vibrating, at least in the transverse direction. Again, you're going to get a doubling. So because of this term here, what you find is that uh, delta phi star is, of course, equal to the same p plus x prime squared acting now on the gauge. P I guess I called it omega before. And what this implies is that you can gauge away omega star unless it satisfies the fact that the mass squared is equal to this. Okay, so you get, okay, can gauge away phi star unless p0 squared is equal to the same thing as before. Okay. So we get the doubling. Again, these are the fields. These are the anti-fields, and this is just the same spectrum that that you learned about last week. Okay, so this is in in light cone gauge. Okay, any questions? Yes. Okay, so remember how it worked in the particle. So we had uh, delta phi delta phi star was equal box omega which means you can gauge away phi star unless box omega equals zero. In this case, delta phi star is equal to this, so you can gauge it away unless it has zero eigenvalue with respect to this. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so, okay, so the cohomology of Q is defined to be the image of Q divided by the kernel of Q. So one way to think about it is that um, if V is equal to Q 
of something, then you want to throw it away. Okay? So what we say, the way uh, a physicist would say this is that you define V up to a gauge transformation. The gauge transformation is Q of something. And we say that if the state is pure gauge, so if delta V can be used, if, if this thing is non-zero, then you can gauge away V. So uh, the way I will be saying it throughout the course is that um, you think of Q has two roles. It imposes the equations of motion. That's QV equals zero. But it also tells you what the gauge transformations are. The gauge transformations are delta V equals Q of omega. So the physical states are the equations of motion up to gauge symmetries. So if something can be written as something which is pure gauge, that's um, phi star is equal Q of something, then you can gauge it away. Is it clear? Okay, other questions? Okay, so um, so this is the... Yes? There should be a hat here. Hat where? I'm sorry? Ah, sorry, yes, thank you. Sorry, that probably confused people. <laughs> okay, any other question? Okay, so now we're going to do the, so this is the last thing. Well, no, I'll do light cone when I go to green Schwartz. But now I want to concentrate on the conformally invariant approach. Okay, so I'll do things a little bit more carefully. Because Okay, so we have, in conformal gauge, we're back to um, this case here. And we have Q is equal to, for the open string, I can just uh, work with the C's and not with the C bars. So let me concentrate on that. So we have... Okay, so we want to define the states which can depend now on all the x's and the c's. But now, okay, if you want, you can choose the c's to be the coordinates and the b's to be the momenta. But usually the way people do it is they choose the positive modes of the c's to be the coordinates together with the positive modes of the Bs, and the negative modes of the Cs to the momentum, together with the negative modes of the Bs. Okay. So, as I'll explain in a second, the B's and C's carry something called conformal weight. So when you have fields of conformal weight, non-zero, the, the way you naturally define coordinates of momentum is a little bit different than what you might think. So, Okay, so we have C of Z. Now, you could either define this, the world sheet on a plane, or if you like, if you're doing the closed string on a cylinder, or you can define it on a strip, or if you like on a, s oh, let's do the closed string just so. We have a map from the cylinder to the complex plane. So let's call this Z and this rho. And the map is rho equals log Z. So it maps the point at rho equals minus infinity to the point z equals zero, and the point z equals infinity to rho equals infinity. Okay, so the if you draw circles on this cylinder, they're just going to be circles in the plane. Okay. Now, because c 
is an object of non-zero conformal weight. The fact that it has non-zero conformal weight comes from the fact that if you want your action to be conformally invariant, this E has different dimensions from the X. Okay, so after going to a conformal gauge, this S became this action here. And you can see from this action that, first of all, the sum of the conformal weights of B and C has to be equal to plus one, right? So if I define the conformal weight to be, let's call it um, H, H bar. So this is the left moving and the right moving. Uh, do p uh, people, maybe people don't know what I'm doing here. Okay, so if you change uh, z to f of z, I guess this is chapter two of Polchinski, so uh, Augusto did not discuss this yet. Okay. okay, so if you map, if you have the complex plane, you can of course do a conformal transformation. Conformal transformation just means that f is some holomorphic function of z. And you can ask how the fields transform. Okay. So the definition of a, of a field with conformal, so we're always talking about two-dimensional fields. The definition of this h and h bar is that under the conformal transformation, z goes to f of z, phi is going to df dz to the h, df bar dz bar h bar times phi. So this is... Um, This would be five f of c. So, um, when I say that the world sheet action is conformally invariant, it means that when I transform my world sheet fields in this way, the action stays invariant. Okay. Now, x turns out to be have conformal weight zero zero. That, I say. That means, for example, that this, uh, let's see, so this action here, because DDZ, of course, has conformal weight 1, this has conformal weight 1, 1. So this is a conformally invariant action. Okay? I could write this, of course, ZZ bar, where Z is tau plus sigma and Z bar is tau minus sigma. So again, if I'm in two-dimensional Euclidean space, Z is the complex conjugate of Z bar. If I'm in Minkowski space, they're independent. So I have to tell you, of course, if these have conformal weight zero, zero, this term is not conformally invariant. So I have to tell you what the conformal transformations of B and C are. And I'm going to tell you how they transform in a second. So this will turn out to have H equal one and H bar equals zero. Uh, sorry, H equals minus one. And this will have h equals 2 and h bar equals 0. Why does it have these conformal weights? Well, that comes back to where they came from. So when you do the gauge fixing, you could ask how E transformed under a uh, weak parameterization. So remember I told you I had these transformations of E that left this action invariant. And I said that delta E was something like this. It was um, epsilon dot plus epsilon prime. And then there was another term, which was something like um, dd sigma of e epsilon plus. It had terms of this type. This tells you how the field transforms when you commute it with these constraints. Now, when you do the gauge fixing, the transformation of the ghost is going to be um, derived from the transformations of these Lagrange multipliers. So in fact, you can derive how the B and C ghosts transform under conformal transformations by looking at how E and E bar transformed under these constraints. Okay? So I didn't do it carefully, but if I had done it carefully, I could read off how B and C transform under conformal transformations. Now, this transformation here is nothing but the finite version of an infinitesimal conformal transformation. 
So if I take f of z to be equal to z plus some small epsilon of z, where epsilon is some small parameter, then you'll see that phi transforms delta phi is going to be something like, um, depending on, on h and h bar, it's going to give you something like h um, d epsilon. So I'm not getting these, these, these contributions correct, but it's going to be something like um, times phi. It's going to be something like this. Okay. So this term d phi comes from just the fact that um, the Taylor expansion of f of z. Okay. But then you'll get also a contribution from here. So okay, there'll be another contribution from h bar. I don't know if this is plus or minus. Okay, so this tells you. The infinitesimal version of this transformation reads off for you the the I mean the finite yeah, if you if you if you make f infinites an infinitesimal transformation, you can read off the transformations of phi. And it turns out that b and c transform with these values of h. Okay. I'm sorry? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so of course. I didn't tell you what B was here, but once you know the transformation of C, so I told you C comes from the transformation of E. Once you know C, you know B, because you know that the sum of the two has to be H equal 1. That's for this action to be conformal invariant. Okay. So you can also read off for B. Okay, so this is, of course, described uh, in Polchinski in detail in Chapter 2. I'm not going to have time to do everything here. But um, the point is that I need to use is that B and C have non-zero conformal weight. Because it has non-zero conformal weight, the mode structure of B and C is slightly different. So what you'll find is that when you do the conformal transformation from the cylinder to the plane, if you define the, the positive modes of C in the cylinder to be creation operators, you'll find that the creation operators in the plane are slightly different you'll find that C in the plane, the, the, the terms which are creation operators are of this type. So, um, so I have 10 minutes. Uh, let me think what, which things I want to emphasize in the 10 minutes. Um, so let me write down the vertex operators. And instead of going into detail about the different modes, I'll just write down the expressions and I'll explain why it has this structure. Okay. Okay, so what are the vertex operators going to look like? So you can see that the BRST operator obviously has a similar structure as before, but now you have different modes here. So the first thing you can ask is, are there any uh, elements in V which are independent of C? So what we're going to do is we're going to expand V as before. I'm going to call it now phi zero. Let's say it just depends on the X's and not on the B's and C's. Then I'll have phi one, which is linear in C. Then I'll have phi two which has two C's in it, and then I'll have which has three C's. So what have I done? I've assumed, first of all, just for the moment, just for simplicity, that I don't include any B ghosts. And I'm, I've written the, the C dependence in such a way that It depends on C, C, D, C, and C, D, C, D squared C, where this dependence comes from the fact that I'm expanding C. Um, okay. 
Yeah, I think I. Uh, so uh, I think I, what I, what I'll decide to do is I'm going to just write down the answer, and then I'm going to explain the answer in the next lecture because I'm not going to be able to. I'm not going to be able to go into details and give the answer. Okay, so the answer is going to be of this form. It will turn out that in order to be in the cohomology, phi zero has to be equal to one, and phi three is equal to one. And it will turn out that phi one of x is going to describe, if you like, the field, and phi two of x, so I'll just write phi of x here, phi two of x is going to describe the anti-field. Okay, so let me tell you what these fields look like and what the anti-fields look like. So we have Q of this structure here. Now what are the fields? We know th more or less what the spectrum is. So we have the tachyon, then we have the gluon, and then we have this higher spin things, right? So the gluon is described by a gauge field, of course, and the tachyon by a scalar field. And then you'll get higher spin things with more indices. So let me call them, I don't know, B, mu, nu, etc. Since this looks like a, okay, in any case. So V is, go this, this phi 1 here is going to be built out of these fields. So it's going to be just T of X. So remember, T of x is just equal to, um, if I write it in momentum space, it's going to be something like Tk e to the ik dot x. Okay. Where Tk is just uh, the mode of the tachyon with momentum k. And then you're going to get the field a mu of x, but this has a vector index, right? So it will turn out that the gluon field will be, in the vertex operator, will be contracted with dx. Okay. Did, um, so if Augusto wrote down the vertex operators in light cone gauge, which maybe, he, did he do that in light cone gauge? Sorry? Okay. B but he wrote the spectrum in terms of the modes? Okay, so this, in light cone gauge, this was something like aj of, Aj times, um, so he had the these modes Aj e to the ik dot x something like this. So he had something like this. So when you write this covariantly, this has this form. Okay, this is just the transverse components of the dx mu. Then the the mass of things you'll get, you could get something like this. Or you could get things of lower spin, for example, d squared x rho. So these are the more general vertex operators. So what I'm going to concentrate is on the massless ones, because those are the ones that are going to survive in the superstring. So of course, in the bosonic string, we have the tachyon, but that's going to be eliminated in the superstring. But the gluon vertex upper is going to have a very similar structure in the superstring as it has in the bosonic string. So what I want to tell you a little bit is about, if we restrict to the massless sector, what the states look like. So we, we immediately know, of course, that we're going to get gluons and not scalars. So it's going to be different from the particle. So if you remember in the particle, what we had is we had V equals So there was a question about why the physical states are sitting at ghost number zero. In the string, it will turn out the physical states it sits at ghost number equal one. And the anti-fields will sit at ghost number equal two. The reason, the central reason for that is because if you look in the massless sector, 
the physical states have a gauge symmetry. So the physical states are gluons, which unlike scalars, have a gauge symmetry. So delta A mu is supposed to have a gauge symmetry of the type d mu lambda. Remember in, this in, the, in the particle case, the tachyon was a ghost number zero, and there was no gauge symmetries. Remember, this comes from delta V equals Q of omega. So the gauge transformations, as I said a few times, come also from the BRST operator. The equation of motion is Q of V equals zero, and the gauge transformations are delta V equals Q of omega. In the particle, the scalar, of course, had no gauge symmetry, which was connected to the fact that the physical states have ghost number zero. But now the physical states have a gauge symmetry, so there has to be an omega sitting in the theory which produces this gauge symmetry. Now Q has ghost number one, so if the physical state transforms, the only way that's possible is if the physical state is at ghost number one, BST operator is ghost number one, so omega has ghost number zero. So omega, if we start it this way, let's call this omega zero, omega one. Then we see that this omega zero can be responsible for the gauge transformation of the gluon. So let's see how that works. So we're going to define omega to be just starting with the gauge parameter lambda, this lambda here. And now I compute Q of omega. So Q is given here. So remember that dx in, um, when you do canonical quantization, d tau x is just going to be related to the momentum. So when you commute Q with V, you'll get something like this. You'll get the contribution which is just C times dx times d dx of lambda. So that comes from the fact that dx if you use the equation of motion for P, it's just going to be related to P. So this is going to have a term which is just C dx mu delta V mu. So that's of course consistent with the identification of this state here as being the gluon. So if we write down V here and we restrict just to the massless field, So we have the <coughs> then we see that delta A mu transforms in the appropriate way. Okay. So unlike the particle, for the string, the physical states have to be at ghost number one. And what's at ghost number zero? So at ghost number zero, we can do the same computation. So if we ask the QV equals zero, and we use the fact that Q starts with C dx dx, then that implies that um, V starts here. So that implies that d mu phi zero equals zero. So if we require that qv equals zero, we find that this state here has to be a constant. If q on it is zero, so that implies that this object here is zero, the only way that's possible is if this is a constant. So this, it's a constant mode, so I can just, uh, Let's call it, um, well, constant. Let's call it uh, lambda. 
So it's independent of it's independent of x. So when we compute the cohomology, we find at ghost number zero, you just have a single constant. At ghost number one, at least in the massless sector, you have a gluon. So we'll see next time that you actually get the gluon. Then at ghost number two, you get the antifield. And at ghost number three, you'll find you also get a constant. Okay, so that's the answer. Um, it turns out this constant is related to the fact that the gauge parameter here, if you um, ask which gauge parameters don't transform the gauge field, so if lambda is a constant here, delta mu equals zero. So um, in BRST language, that means that the constant mode of lambda is in the cohomology. Okay, so um, okay, I'll have to recalibrate how I'm going to do tomorrow's lecture. But what we'll see is that the the fields of the string sit at ghost number one, the antifield sit at ghost number two, and that same structure is going to continue for the superstring. Okay, so I think you've gotten a lot of information in this lecture. So I'll be around in the afternoon. So if people have questions, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So So remember v is a function of all the modes of c. So you have x and c. Okay, so you have c minus c. So in principle, yes, you could write down pi 0 plus c. So for example, C minus 1, C or 0. So first of all, because C is anti-commuting, the only way to get more Cs is if you keep changing the mode number, because any of the mode numbers squared is 0. So yeah, so there's a, a term proportional to 3 Cs, and you'll have a term proportional to 4. You'll just need more and more of these. And in principle, it goes up to infinity. Okay? Now, because these have more and more mode numbers, these will get more and more massive. But what you find is when you compute the cohomology, you'll find that all of these states drop out of the cohomology. So the cohomology only involves physical states. In fact, the only physical state here is a constant. So this is a, a feature of the, super, of the string and the superstring, but certainly the, the states in principle could have arbitrary high ghost number. There's nothing that stops it. Other questions? OK, let me ask a question which will help me organize the second lecture. So for how many people, so there were two halves in this talk, before and after the break. Before the break, how was the speed? I mean, are the, how many people thought that was going too quickly? OK, so this is for the first hour. For the first hour, people thought that I was going too quickly. So for the second hour, for sure, people thought I was going too good. OK, so, so um, so for those people who raised their hands, um, so let's split it up a little bit. So for the particle, how many people thought that was going too quickly? For the particle. OK, so that was OK. So for the string, people, uh, for the string, how many people thought I went too quickly? OK, so um, and f how many people thought that the speed was OK during the first half? So it's about half and half. Um, so, okay. So let me give some references. F so for the um, yeah, for the string, I would I'd say the only thing to do is to read chapter two of Polchinski. I think there's nothing else to say. Um, okay. So, but at least now I have a better gauge. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>